There we go. There's my girl. That thing is being stupid tonight, you know. There you go. Can you hear me, Shanae? Miss Belanger. Yes. There's my girl. I can hear you. Okay. It's being stupid right now. So I'm not sure what it's doing. So yeah, it's frustrating me. So let's get started on this thing. There we go. It's causing me all kinds of grief. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm glad people, we got some people finally jumped on. There's something I wanna talk about that has been on my mind for a minute. I'm trying to write something of a book, I guess is what you could call it. My silly ass hobby. And there's a, um, there's some things about what I wanna discuss that have, um, see, I got so frustrated, I can't even think. All right, what's up, Shay? How you doing, bub? Sorry, I was muted. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're more than welcome. That thing was causing me grief. So I'm just gonna start reading and go from there. All the thoughts are in here, but I can't seem to get them organized quite correctly right now. So I've read some of it not long ago, and if you'll bear with me, I've uh, gone over it and made some changes. We have kind of worked together on uh, on some aspects of it, discussing it, passing it back and forth between ourselves to come up with something I think is quite relevant to what we're discussing, quite, quite relevant to how we're trying to live. And that is, um, well, I suppose you could call it a desire for the happily ever after. But there's a, uh, every man and woman will encounter numerous situations in life where they feel they're seemingly helpless. And we all come across it. Something's going on and we don't really know what to do or how to handle it. Those moments of uncertainty, they exist at the boundaries of, um, of our imagination, of our thought process. And just beyond those boundaries is a realm of chaos that causes us a great deal of concern. Quite frankly, many of us that are sitting in these rooms that are practicing this faith or any faith for that matter, don't have the necessary tools to handle what lies beyond that boundary in that realm of chaos. And what we find is we find ourselves unable to help someone we believe we love over some seemingly insurmountable hump in life, trying to fix them. And that's typically how it shows up. And people begin to derive an identity from their ability to fix people or support them, or help them through. And to some degree, you could say that I am one of those individuals on a big scale. But we might begin to doubt her value to these people that are so important in our life. And that's, that's a rough place to be in because how do you fix that? You see, we might lose our perspective on things and begin to believe that we are unhappy because of who we are with. And they may well be feeling the same way. And that's a problem. Though neither party wants to expose this weakness. I want to talk about it. I want to um, embrace intimacy. And there's, I was having a discussion with Shawna earlier about that. And it was, uh, there's something very unique about this term intimacy. But the, um, it's in this instant when our thinking begins to compound the problem, our thoughts rise up unbidden and unwelcome concerning past pain, old wounds, broken hearts, and the corruption of trust. And there is acid upon the bonds which allow love to thrive in a relationship. When we find ourselves standing at this border just beyond which is chaos, this is typically when people begin to embrace faith. I mean, what else have you got? Nobody's given us the tools to handle these kind of things, and we begin to try to operate in faith. Now, where exactly do we come up with that in also true? Because it's essential that we be able to find those tools of spirituality to kind of guide us along this very treacherous path. 
You see, one would think that given the sheer number and complexity of ancient myths from around the world, that there might be some example, some form of instruction as to how a man and woman might love each other. From such grand designs and illustrations, many great lessons to live by have been extracted to the benefit of all, but not so with a relationship. Perhaps they are over our head. Perhaps we are too wrapped up in even having the courage to love that we never attend to the details of attempting to exist in that condition. It's kind of an alien concept. We all, we kind of got sold a bill of goods is that, oh, they kissed and they lived happily ever after. Well, what the fuck is happily ever after? What's that look like? And that's the real thing, because that's where everything good in a person's life originates from, the, the continuation of that moment, in whatever degree is possible for a, humans, for a human being. Um, see, one of, one of wedded bliss, so to speak, because the instant it gets tough or a doubt is fostered by a friend or things fail to go as we believe they should, it seems as if a tidal wave of negative emotion is standing by to deluge us with all the reasons we shouldn't. And we begin to slowly poison our own best interest while at the same time bargaining with ourselves that, well, this is really okay. The slow death of our hearts as we can see to become victims. Surely there must be some example of how to overcome such a bipolar state of existence for literally the most important thing which will ever happen to us in our lives. Where do we find that? Just how do we enjoy the happily ever after so prominent in our fairy tales, legends, and stories of our faith? Because that's the real deal. I mean, the, the biggest bill of goods that's ever been sold to the world is the happily ever after of a place in heaven. We get a happily ever after for the warrior's death. I mean, think about how powerful that idea is to motivate an individual to do great and dangerous things. If there's a happily ever after, um, after you've lost your life on the battlefield, you have Valhalla or Vingol for Folkvanger, or you have heaven, or you have paradise, or you have all of these things. These men are great men and women willing to go to great lengths, extremes of existence, because there's the hint, an uncertain promise of a happily ever after. And yet right here, right now, when we're trying to exist with someone we care about, where's that at? Now, I've always said, if you show me a problem in life, I can find a solution for it in the Lord. Whether people like it or not, it's there. It has been a foundation of faith for people for tens of thousands of years before somebody put it down on paper a thousand years ago. Somehow there was a way for them to operate in a tribe. We don't live in a tribe like that. We're not huddled around a fire. We're separated from the elements. We have a roof over our head. We have a, a floor that separates us from the earth or all of our needs are met if we just go down to the local convenience store. We don't have to struggle like they do. And yet, if you think about it, these amazing concepts of personal being are still as valid then as they are today. That's kind of important. See, like everything else good in this world, we must be ready to sacrifice for it, to learn from it, identify the things which will hold it back and work for it. Oftentimes, the majority of this work will be accomplished before someone is even ready to meet with a life partner of some sort. This is the rare bird indeed who finds themselves in the middle of such angst and has what it takes to get themselves out of it. But where do we learn such things? Where might we find the ideas our ancestors might have used to handle the difficulties of growth? A regular person in an arranged marriage had to figure it out somehow, some way. Our ancestors were smart enough to set aside money if the wife decided she wanted to get a divorce long ago, if there was some kind of separation. Before that, yeah, you just hit him in the head with a rock, it would be all right. This is no longer acceptable. Um, but the fact that they could use the tail then to do something, as we can use today, guys, we're on something special. How in the world are we supposed to find the example which gives us the confidence to unlearn all of those harmful responses to the pain of our love life? Because this is what's happening. When that doubt begins to be fostered, when these ideas uh, begin to take root and grow in our minds about, well, I'm not really sure, we see red flags. Well, I can accept that. There's another, I can accept that too. Oh, that's just too much, but I've already accepted all this. I can accept that too. Where's the guidance to deal with that? Are we to believe that it doesn't exist? 
are we to sit here and think that what little bit that we have is not sufficient to guide us? Well, I think there's more to it than that. See, for centuries, marriages were arranged. People had to figure out how to make things work, mostly for survival. See, we're not surviving. In today's world where we live with the luxury of kings, we have the time to take into consideration the higher ideals of the relationships concerning men and women. What has happened, though, is that when we sacrifice the formality of the great man and woman making ceremonies of old for the convenience of today, we wounded ourselves. In many cases, very deeply, we, fail, we have failed to properly utilize this allotted time to expand upon and expound upon the, the literal power of love. Now we have men asking a woman to tell him he is man enough and women hopefully waiting on that man who will make her feel and treat her like a woman. So it would seem that one of the very first things we might need to try and find within our love in our lore is a situation similar to this. Now that statement there about a man asking a woman if he's man enough, <laughs> there's a concept about intimacy that, that we were discussing earlier. And it, and it does revolve around sex, and that's a touchy subject for a lot of people. See, a woman has a capacity to enjoy that far beyond what her partner might be able to produce. She can go down. I've heard a best, best way you can sum it up is I heard a lesbian tell me one time, she said, I really don't care. I can go down and buy mine as big as I want to. So what is going on there is this real intimacy that most men are completely ignorant of because they're waiting on her to say, oh, you're man enough, which probably could never be true. What is really going on here is a very special moment that two people share with each other in a healthy, grown-up and adult way where they're confident in themselves to share something very special with the other person. And that's a very scary place to be because it involves a hell of a lot of risk because it means you're probably going to have to fall back on your ability to be competent, confident, secure in who you are, what you look like, how you feel, whether that person is playing the game or not. This is a very hard thing for most people to do. And if you look across the spectrum of people that you know, you will see individuals that actively work to manipulate the denial of certain expressions of self so that they can still feel like they're in control, like they have a handle on the situation, like they're in charge. But I got news for you. Um, if you create an environment, this is why I harp on this all the time, to create an environment where a woman might be free to express the beauty of who she is, that isn't anything that a man could even begin to control. And yet when you extrapolate that insecurity of this woman being able to enjoy herself far beyond what her partner produces, you come across women that are completely clad in black, walk a little bit behind me, you can only wear a dress and have long hair. Um, all of these stipulations in society to kind of keep them in check because it's really a terrifying thing to think she might be more than I can handle and men deal with that on a daily basis, especially if there's been no man making ceremony where other men come together and say, yes, you are man enough now. You have achieved this goal. You have met this standard. These other men confer masculinity upon that man so he might go forth and be confident in who he is. You see, the very foundational concept of Christianity of these divine twins Cain and Abel, two masculine images, not a masculine and feminine like every other pagan faith in the world throughout time, completing, completing, competing, complementing, equal and opposing forces that come together within an individual. Christianity through his two boys, one killed the other in this murderous, jealous rage, and we're supposed to figure out how we're man enough in that when one side of you is bad and must be denied. We have a real situation here. This is really pretty deep stuff. But I assure you, if we can navigate our way through that, this has the potential to be something far beyond just the uh, backyard barbecue kegger. This is the kind of subject matter 
that gives us a place at the table of the legitimacy of all of these other world faiths and quite frankly to surpass them because we live in such a comfortable time now when we have the time to sit around if we got time to sit around and watch the damn kardashians we got time to sit around and kind of figure out hey what should I do to develop myself into something a little bit better, to be worthy of this love that I take for granted and figure out how to love myself? And that's such a bandied about term and so commonplace. Well, you've got to learn to love yourself. Well, how the fuck you do that? I'll get to it. <clears throat> what would it look like if a god managed to become something great without enduring the trials other gods and goddesses endure to become what they must become? We didn't end up with somebody like Loki. Always kind of stirring up shit, creating drama, screwing things up. See, we really don't know what the answer to that because there are none. Every being we consider divine in our pantheon has chosen to handle the problems of growth. Insofar as the development of a healthy relationship, which endures the tough times, there is but one option, and that is Balder and Nana. Balder and Nana undergo the transformation of death, which we might also perceive as the death of the ego, along with many other things we shall discuss, to become that loving couple on their own journey, separate from a crowd that's still dealing with a bunch of nonsense. There are a lot of us in also true and other pagan faiths that have that sensation of feeling kind of like we're on our own path, kind of away from everybody. I see them doing this over here, but I really don't feel like that anymore. See, we find Balder and Nana undergo the transformation. We find other examples in the Celtic and the Greek lore. Eros and Psyche come to mind as a couple who undergo the radical transformation of death and rebirth to enjoy a divine state of being. God, I hate these Celtic names. I can't pronounce them. Caribameth and Angus of the Celtic spirituality are also prime examples of the transformative power of love. And they are all examples of couples who must grow through some phase of life to even know how to love someone properly. Theirs is the tale beyond the happily ever after part of the story, and yet we struggle with all of it as if it were a little literal tug of war in our mind. We actively tussle with this half-hearted attempt to love another person, usually trying to decide if it is enough or too much, playing this little game. Unable or unwilling to let go of the egotistical thought, what if I look like a fool? Well, I can assure you of one thing, that there is, there is no radical transformation on the horizon so long as we cling to such thoughts. What if I look like a fool? Nor will there be a happily ever after, because we're waiting on something out there to tell us that we're okay enough to enjoy a state of being we desperately desire. Less wisdom by far is found hidden in another man's heart. It's tough to let go of them, though, isn't it? What will people think? What will I become if I fall all the way in love? What if I try my best and it still fail? Doubts, unsubstantiated doubts concerning what we believe to be the most accurate barometer of how emotionally healthy an individual we may consider ourselves. Failing means we have egg on our face in front of our friends. Well, my goodness. Fortunately, everyone understands when you call the other person crazy, well, you got to pass. You're off the hook. You don't really have to explain any of your fucked up behavior. Well, they're crazy. Well, okay. You're still good, then. You're still good in our eyes. Good deal. Go find a new one. And we receive the tacit approval to avoid dealing with why we keep coming up short in the most vital arena of our life. Even a cursory glance across the board of relationships in our lives will yield glimpses of the weaknesses and the strengths we find in the examples I've listed. Every couple is a microcosm of the emotions, the reactions, and the joy and the pain found in these and many other ancient tales. But the text is kind of old and our own thinking sometimes hinders our ability to perceive what's being told to us. I know people right now following this great study, this academic idea, um, there's an ancient Egyptian legend that the Greeks were very fond of talking about that I think is most pertinent today of individuals who, when Thoth created writing, he took it to the Pharaoh and said, look what I've done. We can write everything down and we'll know all these things. And the Pharaoh said, no, the only thing you've done is created a way for us to have fond remembrances. And though they may read the words, they possess not the wisdom with which the mentors or the people that lived this possess. 
So if you don't have somebody helping you, holding your hand, walking you through this, helping you understand these words, we're always going to perceive that in the easiest way because of all of the things we've been through, the things that shaped our lives, that, that helped create the lenses through which we view the entire world. Well, I really don't want to talk about that. That's 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 that really doesn't apply to me or this. Really, well, that doesn't really what that means. That it's well, it's a lot easier if I do it this way. I see academics reading these words and coming up with the wrong conclusions, as it says in Harry Potter. I see them applying their keen and penetrating intellect to such situations and routinely coming up with the wrong fucking conclusion. The greatest part of who and what we are is not out there. These gods are not loving fathers sitting there guiding us. That they are a part of who we are. If you, if you think about how we've developed cognitive ability through the generation of 400,000 years of human beings on this planet, <laughs> you have our physical body and how we interact in the world, and then you have another part of yourself that is this cognitive ability, this interlock that makes the connection between the emotional, the mental, the spiritual, and the physical. And we create all of these things that how to figure out and relate to other people. And in that, you find Jung's archetypes, all of these gods, they rotate through like the lens of a kaleidoscope. So we might perceive something at this point and perceive something at this point. We'll look through this lens. It gets very confusing, but they're a part of us. So when we talk about all of these gods and goddesses, we're not talking about something out there affecting our life. We're talking about something in here that is a very pertinent part of the lens through which we operate in the world that helps us navigate and control what's going on around us. It also lends itself to the very curious idea that we are also very much creators in our own right. Everything you see around you was a thought in somebody's head and he fucking made it a reality. And yet when it comes to the idea of love and emotional health, we suck. <laughs> where's, our, where's our creativity then? You see it manifested in the sickest of ways on porn sites, and the value of some young lady or some man, he begins to believe resides squarely between his thighs or her thighs, and that's the value of who they are. Well, they must want me because, well, fuck, even I'll get to that in a minute. In a world which daily threatens to fall into the chaos of the mob mentality, when two people accept the responsibility to start loving each other, we truly begin to change the world, don't we? What a radical idea, then. Balder and Nana on this path, loving each other, find something new. They, they return to a world that bears ripened fruit and fields unsown. Is that possible for us? Should we consider that a part of our faith? Do we dare have hope in such an arena? Fuck yes. The success of the interpersonal relationships between a man and a woman in their home fosters untold blessings to everyone around them. Their children have a higher propensity to grow up and be happy, healthy, and whole. Their grandchildren have romantic heroes and a love story for the ages to fire their imagination and hopefully an example to follow suit. Mothers and fathers especially will enjoy a bit of peace knowing their children are content. There just is no downside to it. And yet we can't fucking do it. Yet it is the most difficult thing in the world to do, to love someone. Some folks will go so far as to say it may not be a natural state of being. I disagree vehemently. Well, where exactly does that info come from? What's it look like in our world? This idea that a man and woman might live happily ever after. Well, that's the thing. I mean, they tell us this great fairy tale and they met and kissed and she woke up and now they're happily ever after. <laughs> I can tell you where you can find one where it's wrong and that's Brunhild and Sigurd. The successful incorporation of the masculine and feminine elements of each person's psyche into a complete well-rounded being is a good place to start. Now we're back to that set of ideas and archetypes that allow us to navigate this world. A masculine and a feminine. There's something of each in all of us. See, only a person who has achieved some measure of this is even capable of love in the manner it was meant to be used in life. And this is not an external exercise in courage. You're not going to fight something out there to figure this out. You're going to fight the great dragons in here. This work begins very much within oneself, learning to love ourselves. And I've said how before, how to do that. It's real easy. <laughs> it's, no, I'll say this. It's real simple. 
It ain't easy, but it's simple. Picture your perfect partner. Picture how they would treat you. Picture how they would love you. And then treat yourself that way. And see how far you get. See how your life begins to change. Start finding 10 positive things about the person you're with. Start finding 10 positive things about you and see how you learn to stand up. This is not an exercise in building an ego. This is an exercise in becoming a complete, well-rounded person worthy of the attention and affection we all so fervently crave. We find a solution to this little problem of life in all of these same tales. It is a much repeated element occurring throughout myths and the ages. It is the concept of the divine twins. The successful incorporation of the complementing, competing, opposing forces of the masculine and feminine energies within each person is an effort which relinquishes the dependence upon a person's ego for a sense of security in a relationship. That ego is the part that will deny your partner the ability to express the beauty of who they are or support your partner as he engages in those things that are necessary for him to be successful in the world. See, it is, of course, a false and almost cancerous thread which usually ensure the failure of a relationship. I know because I failed a bunch of them. <laughs> usually painfully. But it's such an alien concept to even picture a successful long-term engagement as a couple that most people cannot envision such a pairing without the use of the ego. Well, she stood with me because I was fucking important, blah, blah, blah. Or I had money or the victim complex. I had to sacrifice so much to put up with all of this and I took this and I had to deal with that. But I stuck in there and I really kept at it and we're still together. That's not the kind of relationship I want for my daughter or my sons or myself for that matter. See, neither is a healthy expression of love, not for your partner or yourself. But be that as it may, and this is a book I'm writing with Shanae, this book will be an attempt to, between two people to try and outline both the masculine and feminine points of view concerning the bolts of earth offered to us by the twins Frey and Freyr, along with the journey of Balder and Nana through Helheim, guided by hell through a shadowy realm far removed from the goings on of everyone else, because you will feel like you're being isolated as you work on each other, work on yourself in conjunction with the other. I suppose that in such a shadowy realm where the dead of all the nine realms reside or pass through, however, take your pick, why it could only be illuminated by a black sun. And if we're to reclaim the legitimacy of that symbol as part of our own heritage, I don't think I'm scared a bit of trying to promote that. Like a black light which shows us all the dust on our clothes or the stains on our teeth or the filth on a hotel bedspread. Such illumination in Helheim will cause even the darkest of personal faults to shine and insist it be dealt with before we move on. And that's the part we can no longer avoid. If we're going to begin to cultivate this faith as something legitimate, the courage and the ability not only to recognize and develop the insight necessary to recognize these faults, but the courage to deal with it, the courage to figure it out. Having said all that, and this, all of it's being carefully reviewed by my co-author, we both have come to believe that something more than a sneaking suspicion that somewhere within these stories there lies more than just fancy words. And there may be more than just a few clues as to how we might achieve the next level of such a relationship in our lives. We might find ourselves on a new path, by a path of love. It really doesn't matter if anything is shining upon said path or not. The love of two people has this powerful tendency to blaze its own path, to shine its own light, perhaps even to lead us to a home where all ills grow better and fields unsown bear ripened fruit. Now that's an, an entertaining thought and I like it. But we got to get down, we got to start with brass tacks. Where do we begin on such a thing? So you got to ask yourself, what comes with the you package? What's it like to talk to you? What makes it so special to be in love with you? What's it like to live with you? See, we would be wise to consider our own value in a relationship. Yet far too often, the only motivating factor involved in the decision-making for a new partner is whether or not they're hot. 
followed closely by money and car and house, kids, is there dead? There's a bunch of bullshit that goes on there, right? Are they, well, let me take their inventory real quick. Hmm. What's the sex like being the first of many thoughts? Of course, there's a cautionary tale about this state of mind in our lore, nonetheless. See, while Scotty is fully engaged in the single-minded purpose of avenging her father, she is offered a husband by the Aesir, isn't she? She may pick from among them, but she can only look at their feet. While that's a simplistic analogy, it's not far from the damn truth. How many men and women do just that when looking for a partner? Oh, he or she is good looking. The usual time frame for something that lasts like that is about three months. Three months to figure out that we probably should have considered more aspects of the individual we were once so enamored with. If you've ever been a bartender, you can watch them. About three months, they'll come in, meet somebody, hang out for a while. About three months later, they'll come in single, pick somebody. It's, that's about how that works. <clears throat> Very rarely will someone think to themselves, I wonder if I would be a good match for this person, if I am something which might be a positive thing in their life, because that's a scary ass thought. That means we got to take an inventory of ourselves to see if we've lived up to any measure of success that we ever value. Am I, I wonder if it would be a positive thing. Hard to do that when you're drunk. I believe it. I understand. <laughs> when entering a relationship, it's a perfect time to gain awareness around this key point of being by having a look inside of yourself. And so much of our behavior centered around such activities resides in the realm of pre-programmed thought. So we find ourselves in a real pickle here. What we've seen on TV, film, learned from our friends in school, and most importantly, the examples and attitudes of our parents. Whether we realize it or not, the pattern of behavior Many of, them, many of them are destructive or so programmed within us as everything else is by the time we are in our 20s. To look up in your 40s and finally see it, well, that's a fairly unique moment. I'll say that much for you. So we're really at this part of this faith, if we're going to be serious about this, and it is exemplified by death in these tales. We're unlearning old things and old patterns of thought to learn new things. Death is simply the most powerful literary um, tool to illuminate that idea in our minds. Oh, they died. But yes, we've got to get rid of some of this stuff to really demonstrate the effectiveness of having those powerful loving relationships. And I see all the people talking about, well, I'm going to be a trad woman or trad man, a traditional. You ain't going to be trad shit if you don't unlearn some of that bullshit you picked up growing up from your parents. That's just the reality of it. And where is the courage to do that? So we can give it lip service all day long. But until we start learning some of the depth of these tales, that's all it is. And we're going to be astounded when the same problems arise and the same mistakes are made and are made, and then there's a failure, and then uh, well, she's crazy, and you're off the hook. <laughs> to take up the cause of another person is to put one's own agenda on the back burner for a time to prioritize the other person. Not everyone is capable of this selflessness. It's a real risk, isn't it? It's a real risk to put someone else first. And not in a codependent, is everything okay? Are you all right? Did I do something wrong? No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. See, there are some who are so afraid of losing themselves, they cannot operate in this order. And yet Frey, when he sends Skirner to woo Gerder, you know, there's threats and holding and bribes and all this stuff. But what eventually has to happen is, is he has to sacrifice not all of himself, but just that one part of his mindset that allowed him to operate in the time frame he was existing. See, but now he's moving into another time frame. He 
He's no longer the warrior. He will always have need of those skills, knowledge, and understanding he has as a warrior to protect the home. But to be the successful partner in a relationship, he didn't need to go around fighting shit all the time, especially not the only person in his home. So when nobody else is around to argue with or fight about or jump on or argue with, he takes it out on his partner. We see Loki do that with Sigyn, where his ego and his arrogance and all the other poor shit he likes to drag around and make him feel important got him bound with the entrails of his own son and his wife, Sigyn, which means girlfriend. She has to hold this bowl to collect this venom. And instead of trying to change or grow up or become anything better, she's got to collect this venom, sacrificing everything she could ever become the beauty of who she is completely sacrificed on the altar of his ego. And every time she has to dump the bowl, well, she's going to get a cuss. And I see that going on too. <laughs> Even when they help, they have, they have their own reasons or agenda for doing so. They have their own, which they keep in front of their mind primarily to use against you later. So when people trying to do some of this, they, they forget about, they don't want to lose themselves. So they'll make a mental note and they'll deal with this. Maybe a red flag will pop up. Well, I'll just, I'll, I'll tolerate it this time. But the instant things go wrong, I'm going to throw that in their face and make them realize what a piece of shit they are and how important I am. That way they have to stay with me. But this is not what we want for the relationships in this faith. <laughs> Some people will find they'll find that it's, they can accept help from these types so long as you don't go in blindly. Smooth dealings absolutely rely on understanding other people. And this requires inside of ourselves. This is the unlearning and learning new things, understanding how I react and understanding why I react because I was taught to fucking do that. Now it's time to unteach myself to do that. Now, putting someone else first in a healthy way for a confident individual. It's not as big a struggle as people think it is. Many times a great deal of it in order to avoid reacting to every dramatic situation that gets dreamt up. The greater the understanding, the more ease there will be. And if this catalyst for passion is missing, the affair tends to become a business transaction made simply to survive in the world. I remember one time I was sitting there with my uncle and I was crying and slinging snot in my beer and uh, over some woman that had broken my heart. And he said, uh, he looked at me real serious, dead serious. This was how he was living. He said, do you think I've been married to that woman in the back room for 20 years because we're in love? He said, life is tough and you better find somebody to stand beside you. And that's how my uncle lived and died. He never got to enjoy these real aspects of intimacy or a healthy relationship or love of any kind. And he stayed drunk his entire life. I would like to hope for something more. This is what I'm working for. This is what I want to see my friends enjoy in life. This is not for me to say that I'm right. This is truly one of those things that if you can share that with individuals and help them move forward, that's a good thing. It's not so bad, is it? Don't we see a lot of power couples simply settle for the business model of a relationship, much as their ancestors did? You know, Mary King, Mary Prince, you know, Bill and Hillary Clinton, prime example. Fucking make sure there's nobody fucking hanging around out here and shit. <laughs> the fuckers. But perhaps we're making too big of a fuss about it. We'll see. Anyway, that's exactly what I'm writing on. That's exactly what it's going to be about. And I'm sure that there's a lot of food for thought there, and I'm sure there's a much room for contention, but I, I stand firmly on that. You know, when, you, when you're dealing with individuals and you begin to grow in such a manner and you look around at other individuals and you see how they treat the people they're supposed to love, you don't want to associate with that. You don't want to be around those people that slap their fucking kids around or maybe they had to hit their wife, you know, to get her in line. Um, that's not anything. And, you know, the thing is, is people need to, men that are growing in such a manner that men confer masculinity, they need to be saying, you need to cut that shit out. Whether or not they're your friend is irrelevant. A confident man doesn't have time for somebody like that. And a woman is the same way. If a woman sees a woman dealing with that kind of stuff, a sister needs to stand up and say, hey, it's 
figure it out. These women have got to start taking care of each other. These men start need to start taking care of each other as a whole. And that's what we've got to be working for with all of this, not just the own super successful individual, but if it doesn't resonate across the community and help us stand up to become something better, we're really, we're really going to struggle keeping this thing going. And we're going to continue to pick the low hanging fruit of whatever bullshit nonsense that we've picked for the last 40 years. And this is all it'll ever be. And if it dies in the backyard with us, um, what will our children do? What will they believe in? What will my grandchildren grab a hold of? What will they believe in? Will they go back to Christianity because I failed to live up to a standard that I so prominently espoused? I hope not. I really hope not. So anyway, that's all I got for tonight. Anybody got any questions? Because that's a lot of shit to talk about. No? Such a deep subject, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. I don't even know where to begin, but it touches on so many things. I would like to, uh, I would like to learn a lot about this. <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely am a, am a student. I appreciate it, man. I really do. And that's, I mean, that's kind of what we're looking at. I mean, I, there's all, all the, I mean, it kind of struck me that all the stories, you know, oh, and they met and they lived and they fought and they were happily, they lived happily ever after. Well, fuck, man, where's my happily ever after? You know what I mean? That's what I'm sure there's a lot of women feeling the same way. Where's my happily ever after? I mean, dudes, you got it easy compared to some of the shit I hear, the stories I hear these women go through. I mean, God damn. I mean, honestly, I can, you know, I, I've said it before. I can't think of a single woman in my life that I know that hasn't had at some point in her life to contend with some narcissistic, egotistical, small-minded, very Christian, um, good man, uh, works hard, um, <laughs> and there's and there's nothing there for. Them. There's nothing. There's nothing there that helps them live or thrive or creates an environment where they might be free to express the beauty of who they are. Um, I got to tell you, man, I, th I think that's one of the things that if I could leave a mark on the world, I think that's what it's going to be. Matter of fact, I'm sure that's what it's going to be. That's huge. It's huge to have to be able to help us through this because I can't I haven't met a single woman. I don't think that hadn't already had some kind of trauma before we met. <laughs> I know it's true, right? Did you? <laughs> but I ain't never met the dude that does it. <laughs> well, well, I did. I it was me. I I had a oh, whole list dude. I love you so much for having the fucking balls to say that. <laughs> I got a list. I got a list longer than any any Christmas list I ever made as a kid that I did wrong, you know, to my to my ex. And uh, I just sat there silent. I didn't know what to say. She knew she had stuff on me since day one. <laughs> I, know, right? and I don't. You know, it's not like I could solve all those problems. I was supposed to be solving them as they were hap as they were happening, but. Um, and all I can do is look back and see, you know, how, I, how I can, uh, do better the next time. Yeah. Oh man. what you got, Bobby? I mean, I'm 56 years old and I still have scars from childhood, you know, right. that fear of abandonment, you know, it, it crops up from time to time, especially when I've been drinking too, a little bit too much, you know, uh, <laughs> right. so we, 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 we all had to have our little flaws and peccadillos. The, the 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 secret is finding that that woman or that man that can uh can deal with that they have the maturity to deal with those things and uh if you if you find a woman that come pick you up at the titty bar at three o'clock in the morning you, you need to keep her <laughs> right? that's what i did <laughs> i can see that you can see that be very beneficial <laughs> yes sir I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> I just want to add in there, though, that that woman does not include your Uber driver. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm still married to her. You know, Uber can... 21 be, years later. They can see, and that counts. I mean, that counts more than I got. I mean, I, I, can, I stretched out a 10-year win, but that was... <laughs> 
that really didn't do it go anywhere. <laughs> the, uh, but it, 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 it comes it comes down to fighting your own dragons, fighting your own little giants, and that, you know uh, the frost giants in your life, and um, and having somebody that has the courage to walk with you. You know that that that's what you got to figure out and who you got to find. You know, and uh, I, it's it's I've had a good life since then. But it took me, like I said, three times in my third marriage. You know, I think I might have found mine. Good. Yeah. Well, I don't think. <laughs> Pretty sure of it. <laughs> I was about to say. <laughs> 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 and that's why right there <laughs> I can't bullshit her <laughs> she actually said I have a big ego and I'm just like I don't but whatever oh, you've been pegged I know right I, know it. Right. <laughs> I do want to say one other thing I'm going to post this on my son uh, debuted in his amateur MMA fight last night and fought like an animal for three rounds against this kid that was bigger than him. And um, he didn't win, but he uh, he gave that dude all he wanted. At the end of the third round, they were both just laying there on the floor, too tired to get up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm immensely proud awesome. of my son, Jeff. And I, I'm telling you guys, you're going to see him. He's going to be prominent. He's got big enough. He's got enough of me in him. He's going to He's going to let people know how great he is. <laughs> but, well, I just, I just want to, um, I just want to, uh, uh, how you say it? Um, tout your um, Patreon. Oh yeah. You know. Thing that you have because uh, I, I drew some uh, rooms this, this afternoon and one of them was um, Soelo. And uh, you talked about that, and that, I thought that was good timing right there, and I, I appreciated it. You're more than welcome. I've been uh, I've been just real busy with um, all kinds of stuff, uh, mostly just exploring all of these new things that are going on in my life that are just as positive as they can be with Shanae. But um, I'm going to get back on that and make that thing worth your while. I promise. <laughs> and you know, oh, I, I just, thought about something. It's been worth my while. <laughs> I thought about something today. I owe you a book, don't I? And I keep forgetting it. <laughs> yeah, you do. I, I, I forgot about it too. So let me write that down so I don't forget. Yeah, write that down on your things to do list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, that's a that's a lot to think about and a lot to process. But I think I think this book's going to come out pretty good because oh, what basically you know I outlined all of that nonsense at the beginning in the preface. But what I want to work on, I think the whole concept of the book, and I'm not sure exactly how it's all going to tie together quite yet. I mean, I see it. I don't see all the details of it. You have the, you have the divine twins. You have the masculine and feminine in uh, Frey and Freya, in Apollo and Artemis, and, and just all over the, the pagan world, there's this uh, masculine and feminine divine twins. And I think if you go far enough back, you have Deuce Prater and it becomes Tear in our pantheon. And he had a twin. And there's always a positive and a light. But together, they they have to work together to create to create something. Except in Christianity, where you have Cain and Abel, and Cain kills Abel in this murderous, jealous rage. So there, we're missing something there from the beginning of our found or our development spiritually at a foundational level. But that ties into this idea of Balder and Nana. Here's this absolutely perfect individual and this woman who loves him. And when he dies, she dies. And they begin this new journey with hell as this guide throughout, this, throughout the realm where she has access to all of the knowledge of everyone that's passed on before. And guides him through till he does make this return, this this emergence or this rebirth, if you will, into a world that's been sanitized, it's been clean, and it's all ills grow better, and there's ripened fruit unsown, and leeks grow in these fields. I think there's something to that, 
And I think it uh, may not necessarily have to be such a physical image within our minds that when we divest ourselves of some of these painful things and scars and ideas that just harm us all the time that run through our thought process as we travel through this darkened realm under a black sun, a different path from everyone else. Because, you, you know, as they're traveling that path, you have everything going on back here in Asgard, Midgard, and the world's burning and shit's falling apart and all this kind of chaos. And I think there's some, I, I think a lot of us can identify with that. And I really want to kind of create something or craft something that allows us to hope in this faith that we too might experience some of that within our relationships because that's what we all, I mean, I think we're all worth that. I think every one of us has the capability to enjoy and indulge in that you know, beyond the confusion of past trauma for love. And if, if nothing else, I mean, I'm going to figure it out. Y'all are more welcome to come along. <laughs> but I guess I'm just kind of rambling because I'm tired, but I appreciate all of y'all's time. And tomorrow is Monday. So go out there and grab life by the nose and whip its ass. And uh, I appreciate everyone that stuck with it and joined in tonight. The problems of modern technology whipped our ass, but we're all here and I appreciate every one of you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.